So I think if I start to tell my testimony, I, I, I have to say um, I'm a sinner. I was an adulterer, an alcoholic, I was a liar, I had anger issues. I realize now that over much of my adult life, Jesus was my savior, but he truly wasn't Lord of my life. It wasn't until about nine years ago that I really had the big fall. And after too many drinks on an international layover, um, I succumbed and committed adultery. And that pattern continued for seven years. It was not just one, but multiple women. I knew it was wrong. I would pray with my wife and she wouldn't know what I was praying about. But I would pray, Lord, if there be anything in my life that you would want to change. Lord, I, I want you to change it. We were unpacking verses in 1 John. If we claim to be walking in the light, but we walk in darkness, we lie and the truth is not in us. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and do not walk in truth. If we claim that we have not sinned, we make Jesus a liar and the truth truly is not in us. Yet if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And that was the convicting moment that I knew I needed to confess. And I had to do it right then. And I got up in front of the 40 plus men and I confessed the truth and the extent of my sin over the past seven years. And I expected every one of those men to tell me to leave because I'd lied to them. The most amazing thing happened. Every one of those men got up out of their chairs. They laid hands on me. They prayed for me. They prayed for my wife, Jenna, who later I confessed all to. And the destruction and what it did to her is just criminal. We can choose our circumstances, but we cannot choose the consequences of our sin. After I confessed and she knew the extent of my sin, I advised her that she should just leave. She just should take what was rightfully hers, which was most of everything that I was worth and run. The most amazing thing is that she heard a little tiny voice inside her that said, trust me. And even though she had filed divorce papers and they're on file in the court and we'd been separated, she invited me back into our home. I'm a broken man, but because of Christ crucified, I know my sins, past, present, and future, are nailed there to the cross with him. And while he is the propitiation for my sin, I'll have to live with the consequences of my sin for the rest of my life. But God's grace is so amazing. I've experienced forgiveness, forgiveness I don't deserve. I just uh, hope and pray that those that are hearing my testimony and are struggling with something in their lives will realize that if they let go and confess that God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us, and he will and he does. He truly is now what he wasn't before. He is the Lord of my life. And he is the only one I want to have Lord of my life. Thank you, Jesus.
Well, if you're tuning in the video, I'm not already perspiring. We just had some great baptisms, and it was rather exuberant. But I'm so glad you're here. Um, I've walked with this couple that you just heard that story for years through these days, and anytime someone sits in one of our offices and says, there's no hope, this marriage is over, there's no hope, God can't fix it, these are one of the, the trophies in God's cabinets of grace that I think about. There is no sin that's so deep that God can't heal you. And there is no brokenness that God cannot bring to redemption. And there is no sin that leaves you outside of the forgiveness and the grace and the mercy of God. You can't be bad enough to out-distant yourself from God's love. And some people will say, well, I don't feel like I deserve to come to church. If that was the criteria to come to Austin Ridge, we would be empty every week and no one would be on this stage. And the fact that we are all broken. If you're new here, or maybe this is your first time here, we've been in a series called Broken for the last seven weeks. And a series titled Broken is not usually what you put on your billboard outside to grow the church numerically. Um, people have maybe been confused a little bit by that title, but here's the truth. Post-Genesis 3 in our Bibles, we're all broken. That is why, for example, if you're a believer, you're a follower of Jesus Christ, and you're not forgiving someone, that is not an option. When you've been forgiven, you don't have the choice not to forgive. It doesn't mean it doesn't hurt. It doesn't mean that it doesn't still bring anger. It doesn't mean that you don't still struggle. But you've got to love and extend grace the way that you've experienced love and you've had grace extended. There is freedom in forgiveness. There is slavery in bitterness. And I just, when I listen to Laird's testimony, I just hear freedom. And he made a statement there. He said, I've got to live with the consequences of my sin for the rest of my life. And we say this often that once you come to Christ, it doesn't mean all the consequences go away. It just means that God redeems it as you walk through those consequences. But I love the fact there's freedom in Christ. Today I want to talk about a topic that some of you may elbow your wife or husband and say, did you email the pastor I want to end this series today talking about this brokenness, this sin, and what we're to do about it and how we're to walk in victory from it. Um, it's what the old theologians used to call the mortification of sin. I don't know if you've ever heard of that word mortification. It's not a word we use anymore. But basically, it's the killing of sin. Another way of saying that is this, that you and I, maybe we were a child or maybe as a teenager or maybe as an adult, we prayed around an altar at a church or we made a decision for Christ at a camp or we... We prayed and bowed our head and received Jesus as our Lord and Savior. And then when you left that camp, when you left that altar, when you dried the water off from the baptism, as soon as you get to the parking lot and probably even in the foyer, you start to think things that you're ashamed of. You start to be bothered by some of the same sins that you were bothered with before you became a Christian. If I were to say, give me the top 10 sins that Christians struggle with, and we were to name some, we'd talk about pride and greed and covetousness and lust. And if I were to say, name me the top 10 sins that we as non-Christians struggle with, guess what? The list would be the same. And I, I wish I could tell you there's a book to read, and if you read this book, then you'll be holy by the end, and you don't have to struggle anymore, but it's not the case. I wish you could go to a certain conference or listen to a certain podcast and if you did A, B, and C, then you'd never struggle again. But you're going to struggle with sin till the day you die. This thing called the flesh. Paul calls it the old man. Paul calls it the life of sin and death. Paul calls it the flesh. Paul says there's this battle inside between the spirit and the flesh. Now the Bible does not teach that these are two equally powerful things. The spirit is more powerful than the flesh, but yet there's still this desire at times, there's still this struggle at times inside of us, even though we can sing songs. And I watched across the auditorium today, and I love it. I watched people raising their hands, two hands, praising the Lord, and we can struggle this afternoon with the most grievous, most perverse of sins. And if you've ever been walking through that experience, you're going, why is this so? If I've been forgiven for my past, present, and future sins, if I consider myself dead to sins but alive to God in Christ Jesus, if I offer my body as an instrument of righteousness instead of an instrument of evilness, then why do I still struggle with sin? 
And there's been plenty of answers for, another word for this is called sanctification. There's been plenty of answers for sanctification for the Christians throughout history. Most of them are bad, and I'll share some of those today. Some of us grew up in some of these methods. But why do we still struggle with sin? When you become a Christian, your position before Christ goes from being an enemy to a child. Your position changes. You are completely saved by grace through faith. It is not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, lest anyone should boast. It's what we call being born again, saved, converted, or whatever word you want to use. It's becoming a Christian. And what you did before that point is your part in that was you got lost. The Bible says that you and I are at enmity with Christ. It doesn't mean that we were necessarily as bad as we could have been. We might have been humanitarian. We might have been kind. We might have been good neighbors. But at that point, all we were doing was living above our own theology and philosophy of life. Because if you're consistent in not following Christ and you don't think there's a God, you should be a perverse person. That's consistent. But if you lived above your philosophy of Christ and then God starts to what the old theologians called create an unction in your heart, in your spirit. All of a sudden you went to a sermon, you went to a camp, you went to something, you heard something, you were somewhere, and all of a sudden you heard the message. Now you might have heard the message hundreds of times before, but this time for whatever reason, it hits you on the forehead. It makes sense. It like drives home. And you may say, man, I've never heard the gospel before. I mean, I've heard it, but I've never heard it. That's the unction of the Holy Spirit. That's the movement. That's the warming of your heart because your heart is dead. My heart was dead. That's why we sing amazing grace. So sweet a sound that saved a wretch like me. We don't sing that saved a pretty good person in America like me. And then you say, God, I am tired of trying to be God. I can't run life. I do not make a good deity. I want you to be on the throne of my heart. I want you to run my life. I submit myself fully to you. It's what these guys were doing publicly through a testimony. You do verbally in the moment. And you positionally change. Your heart of stone, the Bible says, becomes a heart of flesh. And now you're a child of God. Your old master is sin and death. Your new master is Christ. Your old man is dead. Your new life has begun. And yet, even though your position has changed, we see that, and it doesn't take long, that we still struggle with sin. The penalty of sin is taken away from you when you're becoming a Christian, when you become a Christian, but you still struggle with the presence of sin, and the presence of sin, the power of sin, doesn't get taken away until we receive our glorified bodies after we die. And I look forward to that. And then the presence of sin will be gone in heaven, which means you and I will be incapable of ever struggling with sin again. Amen. I can't wait for that. I am tired of struggling with this old nasty body. So what is the Christian to do in the meantime between now when I've got a new position, but the power of sin still rages war in my body and to the day that I will be presented Without that struggle anymore, how am I supposed to live? Peter said like this, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from sinful desires which rage war against your soul. Peter, what do you think about sin? I don't think it's that big of a deal. No, that's not what he says. He says, it rages war. When Paul talks to Timothy, he says, we are soldiers And soldiers in active service no longer enslave themselves, entangle themselves with the affairs of everyday life, for they want to please the one who enlisted him as a soldier, their commanding officer. Peter says it's war. Paul says, I find evil is present with me. The desire I do to do good, I struggle with. The things I don't want to do, I end up doing. The things I want to do, I struggle with. Who will save me, O wretched man that I am, Paul says. Paul, who wrote what you and I read in the mornings in our devotional times. Paul says, O wretched man that I am. And he says, praise be the Lord Jesus who has saved me from this wretched sin of body, this, this, this body of sin and death. There's this flesh and spirit battle. It's what we call the doctrine of sanctification. And like I said, the history of Christianity has had some pretty bad views of sanctification. I'll just go to some more recent ones because we could be here all day. But back in the 1800s in the United States, there was something called the holiness movement. 
Some of you grew up in the holiness movement are the, the ramifications from it. That if you really want to follow Christ, if you really want to be intimate with him, you get what we call a second blessing. And you may get knocked down in a ceremony or the spirit of God may come upon you. But this second blessing means that you're like varsity Christian now. Before the second blessing, you're JV. But you've got to get this extra blessing and then you can be intimate with God. The problem is it's not biblical. The problem is it's not biblical in the fact that when you become a Christian, a child of God, everything that you need for righteousness and holiness is given to you by the spirit of God at that moment. There is no second blessing biblically. There is just blessing, the fullness of God. And you work that out the rest of your life. But they called it the holiness movement. Now, they also would teach out of this movement that you can actually live, it's possible to live without sinning. And that's a great philosophy unless you're sane. <laughs> you just ask your spouse, have I ever lived a day around you without sinning? They will assure you that you are not that holy. And there was a sense that if you could just wear these clothes, you'll be holy. If you can read this book, you'll be holy. If you can believe these things, you'll be holy. If this pastor will touch you, then you'll be holy. If you order this holy water, you'll be holy. If you order this holy water drenched in holy water, this towel, and touch it every day, you'll be holy. That's what we call religion. That's man-made. That's man-centered. That's little God, big man. But the Bible talks about big God, little man. Along in the early 1900s, there was another movement that came. It was called the Pentecostal movement. Back in January of 1901 in Topeka, Kansas, there was a woman named Agnes Osmond who for the first time in a public setting, she spoke in tongues, an unknown tongue. And the Pentecostal movement started. And what started coming from this Pentecostal movement was that sanctification and emotion became synonymous. That if you could just rev your flesh up and you could get more emotional, and you just kind of create new emotional ceilings every time you're with your friends worshiping, that you'll experience a deeper understanding of who God is. The problem is you can rev the flesh up emotionally, and then again, when you get in the parking lot, you can curse someone out because they cut you off five minutes later. Because you still have to deal with yourself when you leave this room, and you're still gonna struggle. No matter how excited you get, you've got to drive home. <laughs> and you've got to deal with other sinners in your house, right? And then some of us grew up in legalistic environments where if you want to be holy, you really want to be intimate with God, you don't dance, you don't drink, you don't chew, you don't cuss, you don't have cards in the house, you don't play sports on Sunday. And if you keep all these rules and you jump through all these hoops and you wear these clothes to church, and you act this way in church, and you give, and you serve, and you do all these things, then you'll really be holy. Oh, and you don't hang out with the people who do those things, which is hard to fulfill the Great Commission when you don't want to be around non-Christians ever. Some of us grew up in that understanding of what sanctification looked like. You just kind of avoid the big sins on your list, and by the way, you create the list, right? You ever notice that? We don't put the things on the list that we struggle with. We just put things on the list we don't struggle with. Some of us grew up maybe with a Catholic background. We have a lot of folks at Austin Ridge who grew up Catholic. And in the Catholic background, you can say Hail Marys, you can say Our Fathers, and you can go to confession, and you can take communion, and you can go to confessional, and you can have that ring in your ears as you walk out the building, and you can sin grossly in the parking lot right after it. And you're thinking, well, why do I keep having to go to confessional? Because those things don't sanctify you. Those things don't make you holy. Then came a movement in the United States known as hyper-Calvinism. That way, you only do whatever God's will is. If you don't do it, it's not God's will. And God will just make you holy. You don't do anything. God just makes you holy. Matter of fact, I was in a seminary class at Dallas Seminary. And there was a hyper-Calvinist, an Armenian. That's someone who says, I have free will and choice. They got in an argument in the, in, the, in the theology class. They had a fist fight. In the theology class. <laughs> and it was interesting because the Armenian got punished because he said, you had a choice, you didn't have to hit him. <laughs> the hyper he got off because he had to do God's will. He didn't have a choice. 
So what does the Bible say about this growth process known as sanctification? Turn with me your Bibles to Romans chapter 8. We're going to look at half of a verse today. Romans 8. You know, last week we did a talk on suffering and we had a lot of, on our social media outlets, we had a lot of shares of that sermon. We had a lot of sending of that sermon to other friends because you thought of someone who may be going through some suffering and you kindly wanted to send that message. You want to be careful who you send this message to. You send this to a friend, they go, why do they think I need to listen to mortification of sin? <laughs> what does the Bible have to say about this? Romans 8, I'm going to look at verse 13. For if you live according to the flesh, you will, what does it say? Die. Now, you can't logically have different opinions of what die means. It means die. In the Greek, it means die. <laughs> if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. If you submit to the Spirit of God, there is life. If you do what your body tells you to do, and whatever you feel like doing, whatever your emotions tell you to do, and you react to people instead of respond to God, and if this is what makes you happy, even though it's contrary to what God's Word says, the Bible says you are on a path of death. Now, 100 years ago in our country... People would have loved this sermon. Amen. Preach it. But we don't like this sermon today. Because Christianity has become this therapeutic help that gets us through our rough circumstances so we feel better. And God's kind of like we say, our co-pilot or my buddy or my homeboy, but he's not Lord. He's not the sovereign creator of the world. That we kind of draft on his help when we are in problems, or in need, but otherwise we're pretty good without him and we're just fine getting along until we need him again. Maybe we think about him an hour a week or maybe a morning a week. But Paul says, and this is in the present tense, look at verse 13 again, the second part, if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, in the Greek, that's in the present tense, meaning if today you do it, and if tomorrow you do it, and if tomorrow you do it, and if tomorrow you do it. Now, I know what some of you are already thinking. This sounds like a non-grace sermon. Okay? The Bible talks about you and I being saved by grace, and sometimes the pendulum in church swings where it's all about grace, and sometimes it's all about sin. The Bible puts it right there in the middle. You know what? It's all grace and it's all mercy, and it's all love. And then Paul says stuff like, I beat my body and make it my slave so that after I preach to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the price. The Bible says I work my salvation out with fear and trembling. I consider myself dead to, to, dead to sin, alive to Christ. Paul says I press to the goal of the higher calling. So Paul has this understanding that yes, you're saved by grace. And you go for it. You bust it for the glory of God. And it's not that that means it's a work salvation. What it means is works happen because it's a grace salvation. Works come from grace. We don't do the works to obtain grace. That's religion. We do the works because we're in love with him. And he's in love with us. And so I work hard. Here in the Christian community of this day, if you see someone who says, you know what? We got rid of our TVs because I just, I was convicted. Christians start saying, oh, they're, they're just legalistic. There's legalistic. You know what? I don't have lunch or appointments with women by myself without someone else in the room. Oh, he's just legalistic. You know what? My children, we, we don't have the computer in the rooms. We keep it in the kitchen. Oh, they're just legalistic. And it happens in the Christian community because what we've done is we've taken sin and we've kind of winked at it. It's not good. It's bad. But it's not evil <laughs> because compared to today, I'm still pretty holy. Compared to today, I've got a pretty good marriage. Compared to today, I'm doing okay. The problem is comparison is not us and today. The comparison is Christ himself. And, and, and it's not important what you think of sin. It's important what Jesus says of sin. 
And so people will say this, well, wouldn't God just want me to be happy? God is far more concerned about you being holy than happy because you become happy by being holy. There is joy in holiness. I hear someone say this, like, you know what, I'm just kind of sowing my wild oats. When I get older, I get serious about the Lord. What profit did your past lifestyle bring you that still brings joy to your heart today? Instead, it's, you know, I have some broken relationships. I have some irreconcilable differences. I have some pain. I have some guilt. I have some shame. What good do those things do you? But being a Christian, here's what it does. There's not anyone that walks in the door right now and I'm preaching, I would have to go sit down out of shame because I feel like I'm good with everybody. And I don't feel like I'm harboring bitterness in my heart to anybody. I feel like I'm forgiven. I feel like my tabs are clear. (laughs) And even if people are mean to me, I'm gonna be gracious to them because God's been gracious to me and I respond to God instead of react to them because it's a lot easier to be kind than to hold a grudge. You ever met someone who's just been bitter for years? No one likes those people. Now, some of you are going like this. <laughs> it's a hard way to live. You ever, you ever been around someone who is never wrong? Now the other person's going, it's a hard way to live. It's hard being perfect. And I'll tell you what else, religion's hard. When you got all these hoops and you got to always make sure you're jumping through the right hoops and you're doing it, it's, it's laborious. It wears you out. That's why I love the freedom in Christ. That's why I love being at a Bible church. It's not about being Baptist, Presbyterian, Pentecostal, Lutheran. It's just about Jesus. It's just about Christ. It's about the Bible open and our hearts leaping to him. But all these processes of sanctification are going to fail. And Paul says the way you get sanctified is you obey. Sanctification biblically is obedience. How do you get closer to Jesus? Obedience? Man, that sounds like hard work. It is. Because there are times my flesh wants to do things, and I say, no flesh. Down, boy. I heard it explained this way one time. It's my body, my flesh, is like it, 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 it connects to an AM transmitter. It looks for an AM wave. But when I become a Christian, my heart and my mind is now on an FM connection. But the AM still calls every day. And my body leaps when it calls. Or another way of saying that is this, that the flesh is like a phone that rings. And my phone rings every day. But I've got an option now I didn't have before Christ. Before Christ, my body rings, I answer. Because I'm enslaved to what my body tells me to do. But now I have an option I didn't have before. People ask me all the time about sovereignty of God and free will, and it's not about free will. We all have free will. Here's the, here's the deal. The deal is option. Before Christ, one option, do what your body tells you to do. After Christ, two options. I don't have to do what my body tells me to do. That's the free will. You get an option that you didn't have before. That's the freedom of Christ. And the body, your body's unimpressed with what great sermons you hear at Austin Ridge every week. Your body's unimpressed with baptisms. Your body's unimpressed with singing worship songs because you and I both can sing a worship song and we can be looking at porn at the same time. I can't believe he just said that. It's true, isn't it? And the women in the room may think, well, that's a male problem. No, statistically, it's a female problem too. We can be perverse and profane one moment and be spiritual and holy the next moment and we don't understand how that happens. Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of sin and death? Grace and glory be to Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior. He delivers me. How do you get sanctified, church? You get closer to Jesus. Well, how do I get closer to Jesus? You take a love letter that he's written you And you spend time daily in it. That's how you get closer to Jesus. That's not just a pastor thing. That's a Christian thing. Well, pastor, I've tried to read the Bible. I don't know what to do. Start with the book of John. That's a great place to start. The life of Jesus. Read a chapter a day. Get you a notebook. Get you a pen. And then sit down with the book of John. Read a chapter a day. Say, you know what? I'm going to spend 15 minutes a day in my Bible. 
Read a chapter a day and just write down questions when you have them. Lord, I don't understand what this means. Or here's a struggle I'm having. Write a letter to God. Hey, God, I don't know how this works. I don't even know what to say, but I'm just struggling right now. Would you help me with my marriage? Would you help me love my spouse better? Would you help me be a good parent? Would you help me be a good employee? God, I, I pray for my uncle, I pray for my aunt, I pray for my cousin, I pray for my friend. I don't think they know you, and I don't know you a lot, but I'm, I'm, I'm getting closer to you. Would you do to them what you're doing to me? And you just start spending time with them. And then as you're going through the day, guess what happens? The presence of God seems more real. It's not that he's more present because he's omnipresent. He's everywhere all the time fully. He's never someone less somewhere where he is somewhere else. He's always fully present. It's just we don't understand and acknowledge his presence. And so when you start spending time with him, preferably in the morning, because when do you sin? When you leave your house mostly. <laughs> so you just kind of get a running head start into the day. And folks, there's days, please hear me as your pastor. Some of you may not want to come back to hear this. There are times I struggle reading my Bible. There are times I struggle with discipline daily. There are times I don't feel like having a devotional quiet time. But my feelings are not mastery over me. My heart and my mind is connected to Jesus, and that's going to master my feelings. And I don't care what my body feels like. I'm going to do what God tells me to do because I believe that intimacy with him is the greatest thing in the world. You know, we talk about, we saw that, heard in that video about affairs. And, you know, affairs for women and men are different. Affairs for, for women are, is, is about intimacy. Someone that, compliments me someone that notices I got my hair done someone that notices that I look good in fall colors <laughs> women never start affairs out by just thinking I want to have sex with him but for men it's about the physical act I always when I talk to teenagers about dating I'll say this I say you know girls give sex to get love guys give love to get sex Is it possible as a Christian to have mastery of your body? You bet there is. But it takes a desperate daily dependence upon the Lord. Because we're in a culture where people don't care about saying no to their bodies. We're in a culture that's filled, and a lot of them even attend churches, that their body has mastery over them. And Paul says, I consider myself dead to sin and alive to Christ. Paul is saying that every day. Every day I wake up, one of the things I pray, all right, God, I don't want to blow up for your testimony today and for your glory today. Would you protect me because I know I'm capable of anything? I am. I say this all the time, that you and I are one dumb mistake away from blowing it, all of us. And that's why when a, a, a someone who attends a church and who's a Christian, maybe he's been a Christian a long time, and they blow it, and all the Christians go, oh, I can't believe you did that. The Bible says it like this. Take heed lest you fall, right? I want to share a few verses with you. This is Romans chapter 6. Paul's also writing in Romans. Here's what he says in Romans 6. He says, let not sin therefore, 6.12. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. How do you keep sin from reigning? You spend time in the word daily. You spend time in prayer. You spend time in fellowship around Jesus following people. You give, you serve. You do the disciplines because you know your body has strength. You know that you need to be in tune to him or otherwise your body is going to rear its head again. And so we say down body. So Paul says that let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Uh, so not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those you have been brought through death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. What that means is you present yourself to God every day. Every day. God, I've got to resubmit myself to you every day. Preach the gospel to yourself every morning. Every morning. Lord, I need to be born again and again today. <laughs> Not that you need to be resaved, but I need to be renewed because my flesh is strong. Paul goes on, he says, for sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law but under grace. The gospel is all about grace. The Christian life is all about discipline. And those two things go together under the mercy of God. Because if it were not for God's grace, I would not even have a desire to fight the flesh. I would want to do whatever the flesh tells me to do. Does this make sense? And it's a battle. 
Let me share a couple more verses with you. James, this is the, the, the brother of Jesus. James says in James 1.14, but each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Another way of saying that is this. Whenever you are tempted, you cannot say, God did it. God tempted me. For God cannot tempt with evil. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's fully grown, brings forth what? Death. The Bible does not mince words about its view of sin. People do. It brings forth death. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Genesis. That's the very first book, right there at the beginning, Genesis. I want to show in your Bibles the first place that the Bible uses the word sin and what the context is. Genesis 4. So Adam and Eve, Genesis 3, the world becomes broken. Genesis 1 and 2, God looks at all his creation and says, it's good, it's good, it's good, it's good. One of the things I said last week in my sermon, I've gotten a few questions on, I want to do a little clarification here. I had, I had people come to me this week and say, God doesn't give people cancer. You're wrong. Let me explain what I said last week. Genesis 1 and 2, there's no cancer. There's no getting old. There's no Alzheimer's. There's no taxes, amen? <laughs> Genesis 3, what happens? Man sins. What happens, Genesis 3 to Revelation 21? Brokenness. What God does, Genesis 3 to 21, he allows the brokenness to happen, but it always passes through his sovereign hand, and he will not allow something to happen to you that he does not will to happen to you. But what he does in that brokenness is he redeems it. And he can even take cancer in horrible situations and bring about beauty from it. We saw in the, in the video last week, we saw a family who lost their family in floods last year. Tragedy, brokenness. Why do floods happen post-Genesis 3? But we also saw a family member sitting there saying, but God is using this in amazing ways and our story's not over. That's what Jesus does. The story we heard today, that's what Jesus does. And so God allows these things and God's going to fix these things one day. It does not mean that God originates evil. What God does, he redeems the evil that man allowed into the world through our sin. God gave a free will at a point. Man chose. Consequences come. God's going to fix. Does that make sense? And I, I said last week, I can go through anything if I know there's a purpose and there's an end. Once I don't think there's a purpose or an end, I'm going to get discouraged real fast. There's an end. Jesus comes back and fixes it. There's a purpose. His Christians, his stuff is always redeemed through them. He does not waste pain. So look at Genesis 4. Here's the first part of sin. Adam and Eve are out. They have a couple of kids because that will make it more holy around the house. So they bring some offerings to the Lord. And God accepts uh, Abel's offering. He comes with the right attitude. He comes with the right heart. Cain brings his offering to the Lord. His attitude stinks. His attitude is not right. He doesn't even want to give to the Lord. Verse 5, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry and his face fell. Because when you are walking away from the Lord and you're doing what sin your body tells you to do, you're going to have sadness and misery and your countenance is going to change. I can always tell my wife when she spent time with the Lord and she's very disciplined at it. Her eyes sparkle when she spends time with the Lord. I can tell. So when we're arguing sometimes, I'm like, I don't see the sparkle. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, she's told me that before. Like, when I really spend good time with the Lord, my eyes sparkle more. And that's exactly what he's saying. Your countenance has fallen. I can tell you're angry. And look at verse 6. The Lord said to Cain, why are you angry and why has your face fallen verse 7 if you do well this is God speaking if you do well will you not be accepted if you repent if you confess if you do what's right your countenance will change you'll be happy you'll be joyful and if you do not do well sin that's the first time he's using your bible sin is crouching at the door its desire is for you but you must rule over it Sanctification doesn't just happen. You're going to have to fight it every day. And the, it's interesting, the first picture of sin in the Bible is a picture of a, of a beast that's crouching, waiting to attack its prey. 
Sin is not our friend. You cannot be hospitable with it, and you do not cohabitate with it, and you do not slide under the rug. It wants to destroy you. The Bible says like this, if you feed the flesh, it will eat you. It will destroy you. I can't believe I'm already out of time. I got so much stuff. Sin. What keeps me up at night? What keeps me up at night is when I see saints do dumb things and they bust their family up. And here's a lie we bought into as moms and dads and Dave Brantlini hit on a couple of weeks ago. I believe my kids will be better off if we separate. I want to tell you a little story and I said this story a few weeks ago. I'll close with this. I may tell two stories. I told this story before. I was talking to a guy one time and he does hunting expeditions in Alaska. He said, what's the biggest, I said, what's the biggest danger when you got some guys out in the, in the wilderness of Alaska? <laughs> he said, wolves. I said, what do you do about wolves? He said, well, we try to kill them. <laughs> How do you try to kill them? He said, they're hard to shoot. So what you do is you take a knife and you take some animal meat and some blood and you put it on the knife and you freeze the knife in the freezer overnight. Or up there, you just stick it in the ground. And it freezes. And then you stick it blade up into the ground. And then sure enough, during the night, the wolf will come because he'll smell that blood. And he'll start licking that blood and he'll start tasting that meat. And then what happens is he doesn't even realize that his own tongue is getting cut and he's drinking his own blood and he goes into a frenzy. That is the way I would describe that Satan attacks a human being. I'll give them what they think they want and they'll want more and more and more, it'll become a frenzy, and they're destroying themselves, and before they know it, they've destroyed everything, and they think they're getting what they want. Another way of saying that story is this, and I'll, I'll really, really close with this. I was in Dallas Seminary Chapel one day, and Chuck Swindoll was our president. Chuck used to ride a Harley to work. It was kind of fun. You could hear that man laugh all over campus. Just a great guy. And he stood in campus uh, in chapel one day, and he said, I want to tell you guys a story. And this is, this is about uh, 1,500 men in a chapel, okay, just men. He tells this story, he said, I was, I heard a story one day of a guy hunting in California and they were, they were hiking and they were climbing and he, he, he climbs up on this ledge and he gets his hand up and he pulls his head up on the ledge and there was a timber rattler coiled up and right when this man pulled his head up over the ledge, this rattler lunged at him. He says he dodged and the fangs actually went into the man's hood on his back. And the snake was caught in his clothing. And then the snake persisted to wrap around the man's neck. And so here I am on this ledge with this timber rattler wrapped around my neck. And he said, I can feel the hot, warm venom rolling down my back. He said, then I fell, so now I'm tumbling down this hill with this rattler wrapped around my neck, and I can feel the venom on my back. He said, I reached back, and I was able to get a hold of the snake's neck. And he said, I just took a death grip, because I didn't know what else to do. And I'm falling, and I'm gripping. He said, I held that snake. He said, it seemed like an eternity, until eventually, he said, that snake stopped moving. He said, I unwrapped the snake around my head. Pull the snake out. He said, I forgot the word he used. Basically, his hand was paralyzed. He couldn't, he couldn't release his hand. So he said, I came walking back into camp. <laughs> <laughs> I'll never forget what Chuck Swindoll said. It hit me right between the eyes. He said, some of you men are sitting in this room, and you can feel the hot venom of sin rolling down the back of your neck, and you're playing with it. It will devour you. You talk about 1,200 future pastors sitting in a room going, oh. Guys, it will devour you. The Bible says we master the body and make it our slaves so that after we have preached to others, we will not be disqualified for the prize. Is the Christian life about effort? Well, it depends on what the question means. It's about grace. Sanctification is effort and discipline and work and struggle under the grace of God because the Holy Spirit helps us daily and we strive because we want to honor Christ. Amen? It's serious.
Let me pray for us. Father, I thank you for today. I thank you for these wonderful people who would sit in a maybe uncomfortable chair and just want to listen to me talk about you for a while. That's a discipline within itself. And Lord, I pray that we'd be men and women who take sin seriously, that we live in a daily desperate dependence. And Father, we're not perfect and we all struggle, but I pray that we'd fight well. And Father, I pray for friends in this room and across our campuses that maybe right now they feel the venom going down their back. I pray that you would flood their heart with your presence. You would show them and tell them how much you adore them and how much you care for them and how much you love them and how deep your mercy is and how wonderful your grace is. But we need to turn and we need to confess and we need to repent. We need to call it what it is and we need to trust that your way is the best way and that we are not mastered by our feelings or our emotions or even our bodies. We are mastered by you and your scripture. Help us, Father. Give us supernatural power to say no to our flesh. And I pray that daily as we spend time with you, that you would empower us more each day. It's in the blessed name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Hey, before you leave, um, I know this series has been, uh, what I, I would call it, it may not be the right word, I would call it, it's been thick. It's just a thick series. A lot of struggle. I want to remind you that we have recovery ministry here at Austin Ridge, that we are here to help you, okay? The worst thing you can do is listen to these sermons and then go and be by yourself and try to struggle by yourself. Being a Christian in community is horribly difficult. Being a Christian by yourself is almost impossible. Ask for help. We'd love to help you. And also, we have a new fall guide I don't know if you pick one of these up. They're, they're out there. I, I want everyone to get one of these. Now, if you have a family, just grab one because they're not cheap. <laughs> <laughs> but guys, I'm looking through this. This is the best fall guide we've ever, this thing's amazing. If you, if you have any questions in the world, fall guide can tell you the answer. Where are we going to eat tonight? Fall guide. <laughs> hey, my daughter needs help with geometry. Fall guide. We have recipes in here for you from Ridge Kitchen. We tell you what the pastors say. This is the books you should read. We tell our worship pastors tell you in here, well, this is what we're listening to right now. Hey, I don't know which way to turn, right or left. Fall guide. <laughs> this thing is awesome. Make sure you get one of these. Now, I hear people often say at the Ridge, hey, this is a big church, and I don't know how to get plugged in. I don't know how to get involved. I don't know how to get connected. Fall guide. Fall guide. <laughs> if you hear someone say something like that, Fall guide. This is how you get connected. This is how you know what's going on. This has every ministry we do. It talks about who to contact, who to connect with, how to get involved, how to serve. Fall guide. So you got the most important book in your life right here. Bible, second most put a book. Fall guide. Get one. Let's stand. Father, as we go out today, as we commission hundreds of pastors to go out here in Austin, hundreds of Christians, hundreds of ministers of the gospel of reconciliation, I pray you'd give us the strength and courage to do this well. And Lord, we're going to face things this week that this world does not care about what Scripture says. This world does not care about a sermon. This world does not care about even the cross. And I pray you'd give us great graciousness with people. Make us very winsome. Make us pure. Help us to be men and women of integrity. And I pray that this week we would live the Jesus life, and if necessary, we would even use words. I pray we do this well, Father, for your glory, and so that you'll be glorified more in this city named Austin. It's in your name we pray. Amen. We'll see you guys next week.